I'll just record. It's working. Hey, well, thanks everybody for joining us. My name is Mac Pritchard. I'm the founder and CEO of MaxList. It's a job board uh, in the Pacific Northwest based in Portland, Oregon. And we're so thrilled to be here and be part of the conference and to offer this uh, session. Let, we're gonna get right start, started right away rather. Uh, let me begin by welcoming our panel and our topic of course is how to craft a job posting that attracts great candidates. And we've got three wonderful local experts here to share their tips. So let me introduce them. Um, first, we have Tia B. Coachman. She's the founder and principal of Affirma Consultancy. It provides bespoke HR advisory services to HR and executive leadership. Uh, Tia's consultation is centered on strategic HR partnership, talent management, equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives, as well as policy development and facilitating internal organizational change. Uh, next, we have Abby Engers. She's an HR manager at Borley Welch, where she works internally and externally as an HR consultant to make work more accessible and inclusive. Abby is also a licensed attorney and an expert on the recruiting process, including creating compelling job ads. Finally, we have Jenny Foss. She's an internationally recognized job search strategist, career coach, and the voice behind the career blog, jobjenny.com as well as the creator of several LinkedIn learning courses. Jenny lives in Portland with her husband, three teenagers, and Daisy, who is the world's best <laughs> rescue dog in the history of rescue dogs. So let's jump right into it. Um, let me advance our slides. And uh, we'll go to our panel. So, it, First, I wanna thank you for coming to the webinar and uh, you're here to take action to improve your job listings. And we're glad the four of us that you're here. We were inspired to do this because I talk to hundreds of job seekers and hiring managers every year. And I, one of the most important lessons I've learned about what works and doesn't work in job listings um, are, are gonna be, we're gonna be sharing today. Uh, our experts and I are going to talk about also about how COVID-19 has affected job listings, and we're going to share our top tips for attracting great candidates. So let's start a uh, panel by talking about COVID-19. How has, has it affected uh, uh, job listings? What has changed in the world of job postings in the last year and a half? Who would like to go first? Tia? <laughs> Oh, sure. Um, what has changed in the last year and a half for, for job postings and, and job listings? Um, I think that employers are starting to realize that they can't just focus on passive sourcing um, and that they have to go and meet people where they are because there are folks who are um, contemplating whether or not they want to go back into the workforce. And so employers are having to go and kind of reel them back in if you will. Um, and so job listings are becoming much more um, comprehensive, um, giving much more information about not only the role itself, but the organization enticing, um, you know, job seekers to want to come back into the workforce. So that's the biggest thing that I am starting to see. I think there is traction. I don't think that all employers have, have jumped onto that bandwagon yet, but my, I, I surely encourage them to do so. Agree. I also think that, and this might be an obvious thing, but as Tia said, that there are people who are contemplating not going back. Um, and a big portion of those people are probably being driven by the, the idea that potentially the environment would not be safe. Um, and so I, I do see a lot more job postings now that, that clarify, is this role permanently uh, remote or can it be? Or if it's not, they, they're spelling out or they should be fairly clearly what, what's available to that, that candidate. Because I do know from the job seekers standpoint, there are plenty of people who at this point 
are exclusively looking for, for opportunities to continue working professionally, but from home remotely. Okay, so new emphasis on uh, comprehensiveness as well as attention to uh, whether a position is remote or requires you to come to the office and, and concerns about safety too. Abby, what would you add to the list? I actually have a couple of facts and figures to throw in the mix. Oh, uh, we, we just did a survey of some of our clients. So we interviewed about like 70 local clients. Uh, and we, when they were going through kind of like, what's your return to from, uh, work plan? A lot of them were really focused on hybrid, but only 6% were going to go fully remote in the future, which I thought was like a really fascinating statistic, at least for like a, a local flavor. Um, but I can say kind of just nationally, uh, you know, we 93% of businesses, according to the small business optimi optimism index, uh, were seeing few or no qualified candidates off the ads that they were posting. And yet uh, almost half of them were, uh, almost half of businesses are looking to fill roles right now, either backfills uh, that they lost during the pandemic or net new roles now that business is picking back up. And we belong, Bully Welch uh, belongs to an affiliated staffing group. And we were pulling some numbers um, from one of the marketing agencies there. And they said that they were seeing an 18% decrease in applicant conversion rates. So that's like the number of people that start an application and don't fill it out completely for whatever reason. Uh, and that it was costing about, uh, like it was like a 37% increase cost per applicant per posting, which is a huge increase. And that, uh, that there was a decrease from about like five people applying per role to about 1.2 since the pandemic started. So you've seen an increase in cost, a decrease in quantity, uh, and just like a, a people just dropping off throughout the process for various reasons, which I'm sure we'll get into today. So the headline there, Abby, is uh, the, the postings that are online, they're, they're not working. They're, people are looking at them, they're reading them, they're beginning to engage, and then they're dropping out. Yep. Why, why do you, the three of you think that's happening? How much time do you have? <laughs> yeah, so many reasons. <laughs> Don't stop, keep going. <laughs> I, I think a lot of employers are only focused on the money. And I think a lot of businesses have raised salaries, but they're not necessarily thinking about that, like total, total what this job is and why a person would want to be in it. And it's not enough just to give a, you know, signing bonus and it's not enough just to like, you know, raise wages to be competitive. And you really have to look at the job holistically. Um, you know, why would a person be interested in this role? And, and instead of posting, you know, your, your job description, which is very different than a job ad, really focusing on what's the, the value proposition for this employee joining the team. A hundred percent agree. I think another driver is, and this is particularly, uh, I, I think, relevant for maybe smaller companies that don't have designated resources to be to be doing this type of um, advertisement and, and recruitment, but also some of the more old school companies that it, it takes some strategy, energy, attention, and effort to to shift from that old school mindset of of here's our old job description, let's just dust it off and put it out there to a mindset of, of we actually need to up our game. We have to make this uh, a compelling experience from the moment their eyeballs set foot, you know, set on that page through to when we, when we seal the deal and hire them and beyond. And so I think it's just, there are a lot of companies that just haven't caught up to that or even if they realize they need to they they don't have or they don't think they have the bandwidth to prioritize it i t t, I imagine your company's been doing a lot of work with employers on this <laughs> absolutely and, and quite frankly the job the job ad is just not enough it's not enough True. to just say come work for us because we said so <laughs> <laughs> because we, we asked you to right that's not enough Right, we went through a year and a half of really considering what's important to us. If there were no tomorrow, what would we want to be doing in the in the moment? Yes. Right, and so companies have to meet us halfway now. At this point, they have to come to us and say, "We are aligned with your values. What's important to you is also important to us. We are going to do what we can to make sure it's worth your while to come and spend 
most of your energy and time and effort in the, any given day doing the work of this organization. And so just putting up a job ad is not enough. The other part of it is there's a lot of people that are still you know, collecting unemployment. And the, and the way to get unemployment is to apply for jobs. So, you know, what's happening is people are applying for jobs that they may not be qualified for, that they don't really want, you know, and, and on the flip side, the organization is sifting through hundreds of applicants that aren't qualified to the point of, of Abby's statistic of, of these apps not generating um, the kind of candidates that organizations are looking for. So it's so many factors and layers to that. And Max List, we work with a lot of small and medium-sized employers and hiring isn't for many of them a, a frequent event. Uh, they, and often it's put in ch the charge of somebody who is trained in something else. They're, they're not an HR or expert or a recruiter. So what advice would you give someone, and I'm opening this up to everybody on the panel, who's hearing this and saying, okay, I can't dust off the position description. I just can't talk about salary. I've got to write an ad. How do I do that? What, what are your best tips? Um, use the language of the culture, right? Because the other part of, um, of the ad is to almost open up a window into your organizational culture. So, you know, we're not looking at like formal technical job ads anymore. People want color. People want um, 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 uh, character. They want to know who the type of people they're going to work with, right? So talk to them as you talk amongst each other within the culture. Um, it has to mimic that. A hundred percent. This is their introduction maybe to your brand. Mm -hmm. If they don't know and love you already, what, is, what are we all about? What is our brand? And that's that's an incredible opportunity. And I think a lot of times people are afraid of that because in college, I learned how to write this job description or whatever in my HR class. And, and I'm really scared that I won't look business-like or, or I'll look too conversational if I do it any other way. And that's, that's a huge miss. There's such, such a big opportunity to be engaging, be authentic, be genuine and, and appeal to their emotions while you also help them understand here's who we are this is what we we need in this person that we hire um and i i think mac i know you know this that's that's a big part of our brand too is authenticity and, and we work a lot with job seekers that that encouraging them that they don't have to be all textbooky and here is my cover letter and here is my resume. There's a lot of opportunity on that side as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I will say as someone who writes a lot of the ads for Bully Welch, uh, you know, a job description is the, the thing you were trying to solve for is usually compliance based. It's like, this is what success looks like in this job when we're comparing it to your performance evaluation down the line. A job ad is really a sales tool. And so you really, like Tia was saying, you really want to spell out to a person, like, what does it feel like in this role? And so we talk a lot about well, what's, the, what's the sizzle? What's the employee value proposition? Why should they want to work for you versus a person down the street doing the exact same type of work? And so that could be kind of like, what does the day-to-day the -day work environment look like? What is, you know, the office or you know, the ability to work remotely? What's the flexibility? You know, what are your managers like? Uh, what kind of benefits are you offering that are above and beyond what everyone else offers? Is your compensation, you know, above and beyond what everyone else offers? So really thinking about how does this role compare to other jobs in this industry and what are we doing differently and what are we doing better and selling that? Uh, because, you know, not every job is right for everybody. And, you, you know, I, I hate the term culture fit, but there are things like culture ad where it's like, hey, if, if this kind of culture, this, you know, flexibility or this, you know, our mission, like again, Tio was saying, if your, your mission and our mission are aligned, like our job ads should be saying that it should not be, you know, hey, this job might require you to pick up up to 20 pounds. Hey, this job ad will require <laughs> sitting 50% of the time. Like, you know, but that's what a job description is, right? So, you know, they're different tools. They're, they're totally different, uh, Things that you're trying to do with the documents. So Very you're a manager, so. You're, you're following all this advice, and then somebody, maybe in the legal department or the HR department, says, Oh, you absolutely must include that language <laughs> about being able to list 40 pounds. 
uh, maybe it doesn't come from HR, but from I, some, as the HR and legal expert, I'm going to tell you not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, I think the point I, I'm trying to make is there might be somebody in the organization who says, "Well, that's the way we've always done it, and we've got to keep doing that." What 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 did, what tips can you give to that manager who wants to do the right thing to uh, overcome that that argument? And start with why help me understand why it doesn't have to be a a point of contention unless you make it one and that's probably not going to end up where where you want or need it to go but sure yes we have always done it this way here's my observation in terms of what it's netting us now given where we're at with with the the job market and the candidate pool um So would you be willing to hear me out on on why I'm suggesting what I'm suggesting and and give it a try? Maybe we can do some A-B testing, (laughs) do it your way this day, and just try and kind of approach that conversation constructively and and at least get the buy-in on trying it this new way, helping them see the benefit. And as with anything in in business, right? Everything is always changing. (laughs) And if you don't change to meet the need of the consumer, of the candidate, of the workforce, then you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out, right? So there are four or five generations in the workplace right now. You have to appeal to them, right? That you can't do what we've done 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, even five years ago, even two years ago, even two years ago, right? We we had to adapt, you know, and anyone who is in business, who is not in the business of adapting is not in the right place. Probably not going to be in business for long. (laughs) Or if you are, you're going to be hobbling along with with those candidates that don't care. (laughs) You've touched on a a number of mistakes or errors people should avoid in writing job postings and you're just focusing on the salary or including technical requirements. What are other common mistakes uh, you'd encourage someone to, to watch out for when they're trying to write that job ad and move away from the uh, job description? Um, I would say that job seekers, um, not all, but very many, I would say, are looking for a workplace that is moving along on its equity journey. And so it's important for your your ad, your announcement um, of of a uh, open job to include some positioning of where your organization is, right? And it doesn't have to be, you know, we're the wokest organization in America because everyone knows you're not because there's no such thing, right? Um, but you can say what you aspire to be. You can say what you're doing. You can say who you're supporting, how you're supporting, what you're, what you're doing within internally and externally in your organization. And that too will attract people who are aligned with where you are on your journey. So I think that is one important piece. Don't just copy and paste an uh, equity statement on, uh, you know, from online, right? Like it, you need to write something that is really authentic to where you are as an organization on your equity journey. I want to say language is super important. You know, not only that call out of where you are in your equity journey, which I think should be like top of the ad, but um, there's other things that people put into ads that maybe they don't realize are turning off candidates along the way or not. They're, they're putting up artificial barriers that maybe they aren't realizing that they're putting up. Um, you know, something as simple, we talk about like gendered language. You know, that's a really common one people talk about ads. Uh, and yet two out of the three clients that I'm working with right now, when I ran their ads through a free uh, gender decoder, two ran very heavily masculine and one ran very heavily feminine and none of them were neutral. Uh, and what we're talking about that is like certain words are, are coded as more masculine or feminine, feminine, more masculine words might be things like, you know, competitive or aggressive or com- like, uh, uh, and then more feminine words might be coded as like, you know, teamwork or collaborative or compassionate. Right. And so these ads are calling certain people in or out, depending on the language that you're using. And the same thing happens, you know, with, 
all sorts of categories that we have as identities, you know, um, from like age perspective, are you calling in a certain number of years of experience? Do you need to? Uh, are you requiring certain degrees that maybe aren't related to the job um, or certifications that you're willing to pay or train on? Um, so using language that's, you know, a plus, a bonus, nice to have versus required. And then also being really intentional about the things that you are including in the ad um, that, that you're not like call, only including a certain certain person because someone's looking at the ad and be like, well, that's not me. So why would I apply to this? Well, and that even goes to that, you must be able to lift the 20 pounds. Yeah, the vast majority of jobs, <laughs> we don't really need to be able to lift those 20 pounds. And, and what that is, that's also excluding, you know, that's excluding unnecessarily, yeah. unless you're needing a delivery driver for FedEx or something where you literally have to lift stuff every day. Um, it's just so unnecessary to include that. And I do have one other comment that is important and I think gets missed sometimes is give us a blurb about the org, right? Give us on the job announcement. <laughs> what this is all. Yeah. Why should I be excited to work for you? Exactly, exactly. Tell me about the culture, you know? Um, use the language of the culture, but also tell me about the culture, right? About the org, and then get into about the role. High level, low level. So, I, I like job, oh, go ahead, Matt. Oh, uh, I was, go ahead, Jen, finish your thought. I really like it when I see job ads that say, they define kind of, the type of person you are, like you get excited about this and you love to that. And, and then goes on to say what, what type of person would, would not probably be a great fit, but really importantly, and I have a client right now, she's, she's interviewing with a very large company that is looking for somebody who um, uh, supports accessibility in the gaming industry. And that job description was just, or job ad was just incredible. It was incredibly written. Um, and, and that's kind of how they set it up. And, and it spoke directly to her. It, it, it was like on paper, it, it's just, this is you. <laughs> so she immediately applied for it and they immediately got in touch with her. Perfect. Abby, you mentioned uh, an online tool to detect gender bias and job posting language. Yeah, Are there's, there there's paid ones and free ones. I usually use the free one, but Textio is a great paid one that has okay. a free trial if anyone wants to try it out. Good. Are there other tools that the three of you use uh, that you recommend when preparing job posts, either define gender bias in, in posting language or uh, other, other tools that might be helpful? I actually don't do a lot of posting. I am more on the side where we are evaluating job ads and determining how to position job seekers, clients to, to figure out if, if this is the right fit for them and how we position them so they're a strong, compelling candidate. And likewise, I mean, there are several um, uh, job announcement templates that you that are available out there. You just, I, you know, I recommend being as authentic as you possibly can. Um, so utilize those templates, but but make it make it feel um, um, just real for the organization. I mean, I like what you said, Jenny, and it's so important. Like if, if the job announcement describes the role, describes the organization to a T, then the job seeker can find themselves and see themselves reflected in that job announcement. And that's what you want. That yeah, is what it was, it was just immediate. She was, and this was, I'm, I'm telling you the very first role she has applied for, but it was so aligned. She, 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 you know, stayed up late that night to get it done because it spoke that directly to her. And that's what you want your job ads to do. Right. Awesome. Let's go through the process of creating a posting. Imagine again, you're that, Manager's been charged with post putting up a posting. Your uh, perhaps your your job is something else. So you've got to do this, and you want to avoid the temptation of of digging out that job description from two or three, five, ten years ago. So how do you recommend somebody get started? Because I I think you've 
painted a good picture of the pieces, but should, what, what's the process? Where do you start? Do you uh, start from scratch? Do you, do you uh, interview people? What do you recommend? What's step number one? I'm looking at Abby. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, so I, I, when I get these, I've already had like extensive conversations with hiring managers about oh. really digging in and being consultative about, okay, so what's really required here? Who do you need on your team? What can you train for? But what are the things you can't train for? What are, what are kind of like the innate, you know, either mindsets or skill sets or personalities that are gonna, you know, and, and I say personality, like, like someone who's very conscientious or somebody who's very, um, you know, like where they are on the extroversion, introversion scale, like there's going to be some jobs that are better or worse for that. Um, and so you, you like dig into those things, like what is this candidate profile that you're looking for? So I didn't even start with like what the job is. I usually start with like, who's, who's yeah. the type of candidate that would be best for this role? Like Jenny was saying, like someone who sees that in themselves is like, yeah, that's me. Um, and yeah, then if you had a magic wand and could wave it. Yeah. Who is this person? What are they great at? But being really careful not to base it on somebody who's currently on your team. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So you paint a picture of the person. Yep, and mm -hmm. then you go through and say, okay, so what what is needed, what is not needed? And then I start off with like title, which is how much people search and make sure the title is something that people actually search for. So not some like ninja guru chief Ugh. happiness officer type of thing that no one's going to find uh i start off with salary people want to know how much they're going to be paid and then what the kind of range is i start off with location uh and i start off with like the key requirements like do you need a license to do this okay no do you need a, a certain like background do you need to have expertise in digital marketing do you need to know yardy like what are the things that we need start off there and then go into Here's, here's where we are at yeah, I love that, like where you are in your equity journey versus just a statement. Uh, and then probably something about the role and something about the culture. And is that one page or two pages, Abby, or like a resume? Well, you're you're not scrolling matter. online, so it doesn't really matter anymore. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> you, you use exactly the number of words you need and not one more. <laughs> and I will say like, typically, you know, if you're working for your organization, you're probably not posting for multiple organizations. So a lot of the things are gonna remain the same and really you're targeting kind of like the, the top things are changing, the requirements are changing. The role might be, what does a day in the life of this role look like? But the company should be the same. So you're not doing the whole thing over and over again, but you do have a kind of a template that you're playing off of. And is it okay, it, you have an ad, a job posting, but you might have a more detailed uh, uh, job description that is a separate document. Is that or not? Is it one of yeah, the Yeah, you probably have a, a, yeah, but that's not what you're sending out when you're right, able to right. originally apply. But yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Well, three parts to that. Let's, let's talk about, uh, uh, I want to talk about title, salary, and experience. So title, sometimes people fall in love with these wacky titles. Why isn't it a good idea to, to talk about the chief something officer? Uh, well, from a, a search standpoint, you just can't find it. And that goes both ways. You can't find the candidate, you can't find the job ad, unless you're using common language that, that will show up. And most people, most job seekers, they don't know that when you're doing a search on LinkedIn jobs or on one of the other job boards that you can put more than a title in the search box. They don't know that you could put a phrase that describes the kind of environment you're looking for. They're just looking at titles, they're plugging titles in. So knowing that as an employer, make sure that your title is, is as layman friendly as possible in terms of of what that job is yes absolutely and in in addition to that i mean if you if you're a job seeker who is career trajectory minded and you are within an industry where there are kind of ladder and, and like ladder steps to where you want to go chief success officer is likely not going to be a, a title within your trajectory Right. So you want they're going to be looking for how do, if I were to even get that job, what's my next job? Right. 
right? <laughs> Super <laughs> chief like happy problems. officer. <laughs> VP of chief happiness officers. <laughs> right, or happiness specialist. So where do I go from? Is that a generalist? Is that a business partner? Right. Like, what is that? Right. So I internally, you call it what you want. Exactly but true. Like an alternative title that is external facing. Yeah. I mean, we do yeah. that. We have um, our, our operations team is your United Resource Team, Yurt. And we call him Yurt and we refer to him as Yurt. And then whenever we post a job for a Yurt position, it's always operations coordinator, operations specialist. Exactly. exactly. What, what about the opposite of that? The, the opposite of the colorful title is sometimes the, the position might be called program specialist for. Uh, do you recommend using a title like that in no. a job posting? Why not? No, because it doesn't tell you within that organization even, like is for the beginning, is for the end, like the latter. I think, yeah, the, the being able to st distinguish, like maybe it's senior program analyst or exactly. director of program analyst or something like that. Well, let's talk about salary. Many employers leave salary off job postings, the reason that I've heard is, well, we want to see what the market pays. Uh, we want to negotiate and start from a stronger position by leaving the salary off. Uh, I'm hearing loud and clear from you, Abby, it's important to leave the salary in and put it there. What do other people think and why is it in the employer's interest to publish the salary in a, in a job posting? Gonna save a lot of time and energy. So you're not playing this little game of, initial interviewing somebody who is simply out of the range, it's not gonna work. So you should be doing your research before you put that range up there, sure. But it's it's not the job of your job ad to figure out what the market bears. That's, that's the research you should be doing in advance of putting the job ad out there. And I would charge the organizations to go even further and you know, develop a compensation philosophy and then stand in confidence with that philosophy by putting those salary ranges for positions on your, on your um, job announcements, right? So if you have a philosophy where this is what we, um, this is how we value these roles and the work that the, the, the people in these roles will be doing, this is the investment that we um, are going to make in the range, right? Based on experience and other factors that people are bringing to the role. Um, and then and, and then stand in confidence in that. And if you can negotiate still, but then at least you have your why, right? Yes. And you've embedded equity into that process, right? And so you're not going to get a whole lot of claims later on about discrimination and, and, and you know, uh, um, um, pay parity and all these things. So that I think is the work of the organization to do even like go beyond the research and, 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 determine what your comp philosophy is going to be and let it be reflected on your job announcements. And if you're not willing to post it, ask yourself why. Is it because you know darn well you're not a competitive salary company? Well, maybe maybe you want to rethink that. <laughs> so well, then, to, to then you're point. selling the other things, like you're selling the flexibility or exactly. selling the mission, or there's something else that you're selling, but, you know, let people know up front whether that's a choice right. that they want to make, make it that yeah, it's, you. it's coming out in the process, no matter what, it's, it's going to work no, better if secret. you put it they out there. Tell you. <laughs> yeah, and Matt, that's a, that's a, that's a very key um, 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 consideration that folks should make. So I'm glad Abby brought that up. It's like, even if you know that your salaries are not up to par with the market, you look at compensation in totality, right? Because there are people who will take a lower salary for more generous benefits to take care of their family or if they're caregivers or what have you. You know, so there's things like that that we have to think about really much more holistically and broadly than we ever have. Before. Very much so. Families Very much so. Changing, their needs are changing, you know, um, and, and so, yeah, so, you know, consider all of it, not just your salary, hype up your benefits on your, <laughs> on your, on your job announcements. Like, what's the sizzle? Make me want to come, you know? <laughs> and, going, and going back to COVID, for those who have moved out of the town in which they were or, or are employed and looking for an opportunity to stay remote, um, make that very clear because that's another thing. If you can't pay X, 
but you're you're committed to letting anybody who wants to be remote indefinitely that's a big selling point right now it's a big selling point and I, I do want to touch on a, your question earlier ask yourself why you don't want to share that uh jenny another reason i've heard that i didn't mention at the beginning from employers well you know if so and so over here finds out that we're offering this uh to that person that's a problem. And well, they're going to find out anyway. They're really looking on the job board and see that their position is being paid X dollars at that thing. But if, you're, if your culture and the job is compelling enough, people will stay. Yeah. Well, let's talk about qualifications. Uh, I, I know you're all well aware of this fact that uh, recruiters don't expect to, candidates to uh, have 100% of what's in the list. I guess two questions here what why first of all why do many employers ask for more than they actually want in jobs because they're aspirational <laughs> <laughs> i i think a little bit is because they're oftentimes basing it on the person that was in the role who had the ability to develop in the role and so you know instead of the hey we can train on this software experience you need five years of you know, Excel because the person who was in the role was in this role for five years and was, you know, the Excel person in the office. And also sometimes these are being developed by more than one person. So everyone is contributing, oh, but don't forget this and don't forget that and don't forget that. And if, if you have too many cooks in the kitchen, you're going to end up with a, a robust and potentially disastrous job at well, if you get the opportunity to find a unicorn, why wouldn't you go for it, right? So that's what they're doing. They're putting in all these pieces. So they have to have this, and they have to have that. And to Abby's point, the person who's leaving had X, Y, Z, or they didn't. And now we need some and now we're gonna get something it. else that they had for 10K less. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that is that kind of unicorn searching mentality. But the other part of it is we're not doing talent reviews. We're not doing skill gap analysis. Like there's so much work that it needs to be done in preparation for filling a role or in preparation for promoting someone that will leave a role vacant, right? That organizations can do. I mean, right now I know it's tough because there's a staffing shortage, but you know, that's the other thing. It's like, we, can, we could do talent reviews. Who's on your bench? What's missing? What skill set? What knowledge set? What, what is missing? And then that's how you build the job description based on the gap that exists. That, that you need. You want to bring in someone that's gonna help either propel your team or meet a need or fill a gap, right? But you have to know what those are. And so those, those type of like reviews and analysis need to happen in earnest, right? Before we go and, t and scream to the world, come join us. What do you do if you're, uh, uh, you're not formally trained in, in recruitment or you're an HR department of one and you, may not have the resources that a, a larger organization does to do those kind of talent reviews and skill gaps. Are there still practical steps you can take to, to get clearer about what talent and skills you actually need when you sit down to write that job posting? You know, it's taking, it's taking a few minutes and having a conversation with the hiring manager and, and really asking questions about who do you have now? What is missing? What is, what, do you, what is coming for your department? What type of work is coming for your department that's going to help repel your department? What kind of skill set and KSAs, knowledge, knowledge, skills, and abilities are going to be needed to meet that need, that future need? You know, like it, it you know, we, we get into this place of, oh, we have to backfill. Let's just take the old job description and throw it up on Indeed and wait for someone to come. <laughs> Very common. <laughs> that that can't, that's not the future of, of, of the workforce. Um, and so my, my encouragement too, there are those folks who are, you know, HR of one and I applaud them. I know it's a lonely, lonely place to be. Um, but taking a minute, just taking a beat and really digging into the whys, the hows, the who's, the what in terms of KSAs are needed and then building the job description instead of just, you know, using what's available. And if your team is smaller, you probably have a lot more insight into who's on it. And you probably have a, a leg up over some of the larger HR departments that are having to rely more on just like numbers on a screen. You're like, oh no, I know so-and-so down the hall. This is what they do well. These are their kind of like things that they, they their aspirations. Like you should be having conversations too with your team about like what they want to do. 
uh, in the future. But I, I will say one other thing uh, about why people kind of throw the kitchen sink in there. There is a little bit of like a, you want to be able to tell somebody who you're rejecting for a role like, oh no, you didn't have five years of experience doing blah, blah, blah. It's kind of like a retroactive thing that I think people kind of like want to hold on to as like a reason to reject uh, versus being able to have a conversation with somebody about why they aren't the, the right, why, why someone else was a better hire for the role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I know that recruiters, many recruiters are very bad at that conversation. They want something easy to say, you didn't have that five years because it, nobody wants to have a tough conversation. And so rather than saying you botched this because X, Y, or Z, or they really needed you to better you know, you, you articulate this, they'll just say, hmm, we found somebody who has a little bit more better experience fit. at the end. They and, were better and that's, that's what always drove me crazy about recruiting when I was doing it is, is why are we not able to have those conversations? Like what benefit is that to, to the, the candidate going forward? And what taste is that going to leave in their mouth about the experience of working with you? as the recruiter. Well, I'm getting well, off on a tangent. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what advice would you give uh, the HR people who are watching this video about why you should do that, why you should give that feedback, and, and how can they address the, um, the, the challenges there? They might be hearing from a boss or maybe someone in legal says, well, no, you can't tell a candidate anything, or no, it's just better to say nothing. When I'm having these conversations, I usually ask someone, like, are you open to hearing feedback? Uh, and sometimes a lot, a lot, sometimes people will say no, but a lot of times people will say yes. And then you give them as direct and clear feedback as you can while keeping in mind, you know, what your own biases might be. So there's a lot of work you have to do as a hiring manager, as a recruiter to figure out, okay, am I rejecting this person because of something that's going on with my brain or is it something that's going on where they're not the right fit for this role because of these things? And so that's where having that candidate profile can be really helpful. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was interviewing someone for an internal role uh, and they were talking about how much they need structure and how much, and they had you know a great resume. They had everything we were looking for skills wise. They probably would have been very successful in the role but they kept mentioning how much they need structure and how one of the things that's really frustrating about their current role is structure. I'm like, that is not our team. Like, I hear you loud and clear, but I'm telling you, like, that's not our team. And so I had a really frank conversation with her. I'm like, I'm sure you could do this role. I'm just going to tell you everything you've said to me makes me think that it's not going to be a long-term fit for you. And I think she was grateful for that candor, but I wouldn't have known what to say if I didn't have a clear vision of what kind of, of something that somebody needed in that role. Like, and so you really have to know, okay, what structure can we provide? What kind of office environment is it? Is it loud? Is it noisy? Can we offer, you know, remote work? Um, can we offer like what kind of the management style? Are they really hands on? Are they really hands off? You know, what does this person need in relation to what we can offer? What would you say, Abby, to an HR professional who say that's great? I that's very crystal clear about how to do it. But I've got people inside my organization, perhaps my boss or uh, someone in the legal department, who says, "No, don't do that. Don't, don't give any feedback at all." I mean, we get those with references too, right? Like yeah. you have a policy and you go with the policy. There's almost always a back door to that policy. Would you hire this person again? Okay, mm -hmm. I learned something. Yeah. Well, as the three of you talk, um, one thing that just keeps coming up again and again is the importance of research. You know, research the market to find out what the salary pays uh, or what the market pays for the position. Um, think about your talent gap. Think about the skills that you need. Uh, just don't brush off or dust off the, the old job description. Go out and, and talk to people on the team about their needs. In your experience, how long does it take to do this for a physician? Are we talking five, 10 hours of research or, or more? Oh, I, I think it depends. I think right. it depends on the role. I think it depends on what is available to start, <laughs> right? Um, if you are starting from scratch for a new position, newly created position um, that doesn't have a job description, I think it's going to take a little bit more work um, than it would a role that's already existing um, that has had its rounds of people in it. Um, and you, you at least have something to work with. You know, so I think there's it, there's a spectrum. 
And if you have a resource in your organization, say you, maybe you don't necessarily have a dedicated resource for, for this type of activity, think about where there would be a logical person to support this. For instance, years ago when I was still corporate, I was the director of communications for a company doing both internal and external communications. And I was charged with rewriting, I mean, 50 job descriptions. And that, that when I first got that assignment, I'm like, this is kind of weird. Why is this my job? But looking back, it, it, it was, I was a smart fit for that given we didn't have a designated person to do it because I, I was, I'm a strong communicator, I'm a strong writer. I, my job was going around and, and interviewing, hiring managers for various other things like some of the communication materials we were putting together. Um, and my mindset was of kind of that marketing strategic ilk, if you will. And so I would say to, to anyone who is thinking, we don't have somebody on our team that's, that's you know, signed on to do this. I'm guessing you have somebody in your organization that's a really good fit. And I might say just, you know, it's a 30 minute conversation with the hiring manager to get an understanding of who is on their bench, right? We don't have to spend an hour, two hour long conversation. Right. Uh, with with that with that um if you're going to do a talent review that's a whole different thing and that might take a little bit longer and that's a that's a that's a project for someone is to do talent reviews but you know to just have a conversation um in depth about the role that's 30 minutes with the hiring manager it's just really about not being a robot about it, it it's yeah. about taking the time to do this assignment some justice so that you as an organization will reap the benefits from it as will the candidate, but it, it, you're, the, you're the business. Do you wanna reap the benefits of doing this right? Or do you wanna just go through the motions and check it off your to-do list? That's, that's the decision that you gotta make. But again, in 18 months, because you didn't do it right the first time. Exactly. Nine or less. <laughs> yeah, like nine months. months. <laughs> like we've seen a lot of fall offs this year. Yes, see. Yeah. Um, and I, I also say like work smarter, not harder. Like don't imagine that you have to create this in a vacuum by yourself. Like the internet is a treasure trove of resources. There are many wonderful HR practitioners in the community that you can build resources with. Maxless has wonderful resources. Holy Welch has wonderful resources. Um, you know, there's a lot of consultants out there. Like don't feel like you have to do this alone or that you need to do it every time. Like maybe you get help on the first one and then you understand this is the process. We have a template. Here are things we can work through next time we can do it ourselves. Like invest in the first time and you know, you don't have the issues going down with like, I feel like I must do everything myself. Right. I mean, we, we, we talked uh, about language and uh, the biases that can creep into that. What are what other biases perhaps related to age or culture or race or gender? Um, I, how can you, how can you navigate this in a, a job posting? How can you avoid uh, uh, inserting biases in these areas into a posting? Well, you, you don't know what you don't know, but if you're kind of like looking out for some things, you'll see some common themes. Um, I'll talk about like culture um, or for people for like who do, whom English is the second language. If you're using a lot of like acronyms or you're using a lot of like slang, like, oh, we need someone who can really hit it out of the park. Like I'm not assuming someone's, you know, you know, familiarity with the language, but you're definitely excluding a lot of people who might not understand that expression. Um, or things like age, like we talked about, like we're requiring uh, like a certain number of years, but make, like if you're, you know, we, people use that as like, you need at least this much, but if you're using a range, it's like, we need seven to nine years. You're like, okay, that's not me, but I could do this job. And that's the salary that I'm looking for. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years, but okay, I guess you don't want my expertise. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's lots of things like, but beyond the job ad, you know, if your organization, every single face is white, you're calling in a certain kind of person and you're not calling in others, you know? So just being really intentional about the images, the language that you're using, um, and working with consultants, like I'm, I'm sure that, that there are many, many resources out there. If you feel like that you cannot figure it out on your own, um, yeah, there's, there's so many things to look out for, but once you know what you're looking for, it's really easy to use neutral language. 
the things about the thing about ads is that they're supposed to be targeted to a person, right? And so talk to the person through your ad, right? You, uh, I think it was Jenny was mentioning like, you are this kind of person, you are that kind of person, right? They are talking to a person through the ad and that's what you want, right? Because you want someone to say, oh, they're talking to me. They wrote this for yes. me. Yes. Let me apply today right now and I'll stay up all night long getting it done, right? That's, that's the kind of reaction you want. Um, the other thing that I would say is there's a lot of organizations that are realizing through their equity work that um, women and, pe and pe people of color um, will less likely apply for a job that they don't think that they qualify for, right? Whereas white men will do the opposite. And 60%, apply for that's that I'm like 60% me. there, I'm in. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, so maybe you can call, like specifically call. We know some of you may not think you're qualified, but we encourage everyone to apply, to apply for this. So you can actually make statements like that that are speaking to people and not just words on a page. Yep, I agree. Totally agree with that. And this is for everybody, but Tia, hearing you, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up about qualifications and, and gender. Uh, in, uh, when you're construct, you're writing a job posting, and knowing that if uh, that many women may look at that posting and if they and think if they don't have a hundred or ninety percent, they're not going to uh, apply for the position. Should that lead you to to ask only for what you really need? or do you still uh, include a wish list? No, you have a wish list. You have a wish list, mm -hmm. for sure. You, you could build in some wording, just like Tia says, saying like, if you're every one of those things, we are gonna fall over with joy. <laughs> if you're X number of these things, please introduce yourself. We'd really love to meet. A uh, really easy one is just when you're like, you have those bullets and you're like, must have, you know, this many years of experience, instead of using the word must have, say preferred, a plus, bonus any of those words will keep people in like oh you this are isn't true actually uniform status mm -hmm. <laughs> have fun with it thank yeah. you have fun with it have fun with it there is so much room for Great levity time. and humanness in these job ads while still getting it across that you are a professional organization looking to hire a professional. We are all people, we are all humans. We appreciate connection and levity and, and authenticity. Or if your brand is super serious, keep it super serious, but like live into your brand. <laughs> sure, 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 yes, <laughs> of course, yes. Right. And I just want to say, Matt, because I know you asked this a couple of times, what happens in the event where someone above you, around you says, this is not a good idea? If you are the person responsible for this work, that means you have the subject matter expertise for this work. And you get to say, I've done my research. I've watched the podcast. I've watched the webinars. <laughs> I go to my firm, I'm meeting. I know what I'm talking about. I, I like that because they you're, you're giving people the ammunition or, or the tools they need to, to address those objections because they're they're going to the empowerment. Come. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and as Jenny was saying, A/B testing. Like, let me try it a couple of times. I will bring you data. The numbers will talk. We'll see more. You add a salary range, you're going to see thirty percent more applicants according to some statistics. Like, uh, let's see it happen. Well, I, uh, let's talk about getting more applications, getting more views because we've talked about how to create a posting, things to do and things to avoid and, and how to work with your partners inside the organization to make it happen. Now your posting is up there. Um, what are the things that you can put in a posting in a job ad that are going to increase your page views and your applications? Because I hear that all the time from our employers at MaxList. What, what, uh, my, my, my job ad isn't getting any views or as many as I'd hoped. What can I do to make it different? I mean, salary for one. I mean, there's just way too many job announcements out there that don't include salary ranges. Um, so that that is one for sure. Uh, and going back to the common titles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, making it searchable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just using like really like common language that people search for. For sure. Um, and then also like as, as great as it is to post it in like one place or like post it only on your website, 
you know, use as many resources as possible. Like you don't need to spend a million dollars per ad, but, you know, try different things and see where things are sticking and like track the data. You know, are you getting your best candidates off of max list or, you know, are you getting your best accountants off of max list and getting your best marketing, you know, probably reverse, but uh, marketing candidates off of LinkedIn, like figure out the sources um, and track the sources for sure. I think a lot of people like will throw a bunch out there and then be like, well, I don't know if it worked or not. <laughs> we hired have any idea where they came from. <laughs> we hired somebody and they were a referral from so-and-so down the hall. You need to have a good job ad and mm-hmm. you need to post it, uh, but can you rely on a posting alone to attract good candidates or beyond the job ad, what else, what are your, your top tips uh, to, to get more applications? There's pros and cons for every one of these things, but referrals are great. Um, Like going out and meeting people, like networking, professional groups, going to job fairs, um, you know, sourcing people actively, like going and looking for people that actively like have those things, reaching out and saying, hey, I have some amazing opportunity for you. Working with recruiters, plug, Uh, (laughs) interns, uh, you know, contractors, uh, building people on your own team. Like, uh, yeah, looking at your bench and saying like, oh, maybe we actually do have the internal talent to do this and maybe we can backfill this other position more easily. Let's promote this one person that we know and we can grow and keep them. There's so many ways that you can find people and and increase applications. If you're a member of an organization or an association, um, you know, you utilize those job boards. Most associations have job boards on their websites um, and that's specific to an industry it's specific to a trade or something. And so you can get people who are really like have a really nuanced career trajectory. Right. Um, you know, utilize universities. Right? Universities. Universities. Go to career fair. Start building a pipeline. I would even say, I mean, I'm a proponent of starting even earlier than that um, in high school because once kids start going into college, that's when they're deciding what they want to do with their life, right? And you want them to be thinking about for four years your organization. So when they get out and they're ready for that internship, they know exactly where they want to go. But they won't know that if they've never had any you type never of know about you. exposure to you. So creating type pipelines, and that's not for immediate use, but it does pay off. Um, so, but universities, you know, looking for you know students or who recent grads or, or new grads, um, making sure that you know those job boards are are filled with uh, you know the roles that those folks will be qualified for. Um, it's another well, and even not necessarily new grads entry level, you can also target alumni. like executive M- MBA programs, alumni associations, non-traditional students. Mm-hmm. You yep. might have like great work experience for making a change. Yeah, there's so many places out there. Honestly, like there's just like too many and you have to be a little bit focused on like where you can spend your resources as maybe an HR department of one or maybe you have a lot of these postings because you're right. right be tackle. strategic and thoughtful about it, but be as comprehensive about it as as you can be. And and don't forget those who are re-entering the workforce, right? For re- one reason or another, whether they um, were out, you know, incarcerated for some time, whether they were working, in, you know, working in the home for some time, whether they were caregiving for some time. Like we also don't want to forget those people who are wanting to get back into the workforce. Oh gosh, um, yes. Like LinkedIn just actually, it was a couple of months ago, but they added like a thing where you could add, add like caregiver, mm-hmm. they use homemaker, they could use a different word, mm-hmm. but stay at home. Yeah. Uh, they have all these new titles. I was really excited about that. Cool. Well, I, I'm glad you offered all those alternatives because we run a job board at MaxList and we'll, I'll be the first to tell you, we're proud of the value we offer, but if you're relying on just a job posting alone to source your candidates, it's gonna, you're making it a lot harder uh, than it has to be. Um, well, it's been a great conversation. I. I want to get your any closing remarks or tips. I want to go around the, the virtual room. Um, so yeah, I think I called on you first. Do, do you want to go? Sure. Go first go. Um, and, and just to piggyback on that last question, it's also utilize your social platform, right? Mm-hmm. Utilize your employees within, let them know there's a job that we want open. And it's not so much about referring, but so much as they need to know as well that there are <laughs> vacancies in the organization. So, you know, just be holistic you know, be strategic um, and, and be intentional and authentic in, in your um, 
in your, in your sourcing, in your announcement of vacancies, and you will get that value. You will get those characteristics in people back. Jenny, what are your thoughts? I, I agree with everything that Tia just said. I think I would add um, just really digesting that so much has changed through COVID, even non-related COVID things in the last few years. And, and it's just so important to be thoughtful with this and intentional. Um, and it's not a, oh gosh, I gotta sit down and do this. It, it, you really should view it as, as a great opportunity to attract the best possible people to your organization. And those people may very well make your job easier and your life easier or you look better or whatever. But it, it, it's really about thinking about the, the dividends that you will reap if you invest the, the time and energy on the front end of this. Abby? Yeah, um, so like Jenny was saying, like things have changed since COVID and I just want everyone to know it's not just you. All employers are struggling with this, even employers that have it super dialed in, but also know that even though it's not just you, you are not alone. There are many amazing resources out there um, and that, that just because things have been done a certain way doesn't mean we can't change the way that we're doing them. Um, but there are people who are like trailblazing that and leading the way and we can all learn from them, so. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you. I want to close uh, by sharing our 10 top tips for job postings at MaxList. And I don't have a slide for this, but I, looking at the list, I think there are only one or two that we haven't touched on. Uh, Number one was use a title that people will understand, include a salary range, talk about other benefits, share your company culture and brand. Uh, here's a tip that didn't come up, post early in the week if you wanna get more views and applications. Uh, we do see higher traffic on Mondays and Tuesdays. Avoid gendered words, prioritize your job requirements, uh, give detailed application instructions. I don't think that came up, but it, um, uh, that, that's another way to uh, increase uh, applications. Communicate with applicants. Uh, I know we didn't touch on this, but uh, applying for a job is a brand experience for the for applicants and they will remember you and whether they get the position or not. And then finally, track your candidate sources. So uh, anything you all would add to that top 10 list of job posting tips? I, I think that's a great list. list. Yeah, I was gonna say, just doubling down on that, like um, detailed application instructions, like make your application as easy as possible. Like I yeah. cannot emphasize enough, like frictionless, like do not make people put everything that was in their resume back in the posting. Do not make people put all their references in, like do not make people sign into three different ATS systems to submit application. Yes. Like, it's so easy to apply. Well, yeah. Why do employers ask for your driver's license number? <laughs> I do not know that. <laughs> that is wild. It's also unnecessary unless you're being hired to drive. Exactly. And actually, they just passed a law in Oregon about this. So, well, uh, thank you all and uh, each of you for for sharing your wisdom. And um, I really appreciate Tia and Jenny and Abby you sharing your expertise. If you've got follow up questions uh, for us, uh, feel free to email me. My email is mac, M-A-C, at maxlist.org, or reach out to us on social media. Uh, my Twitter handle is at mac underscore Pritchard. You can always find me on LinkedIn. And I don't mean to put you all on the spot, but can viewers connect with each of you on LinkedIn or reach out to you there? Of course. Okay. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. And uh, uh, best of luck to our viewers for their job postings. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks, guys. Thanks.